Hello, welcome everyone to the Cyber Spring webinars. I'm Tina Lee, Cyverse's User Engagement Officer. We are pleased today to host Shravan Aras's webinar on how to make your high frequency wearables data more readable and easier to analyze using sensor fabric. Let's first take care of some light housekeeping and then Shravan will have the floor to himself. Today's webinar is a little bit over 30 minutes, uh, maybe 35, and we'll have time for your questions at the end. Please open the Zoom chat window, type your questions in there for Shravan to answer after his presentation. We are recording this webinar and I'll post the video recording on our website and on Cyverse's YouTube channel uh, later today or this weekend. I am now pleased to introduce Dr. Shravan Aras, Assistant Director of Sensor Analysis and Smart Health Platforms at the University of Arizona Health Sciences Department. Shravan's research areas range from energy optimization for sensors to clinical imaging using machine learning techniques to graded authentication based on biometrics and biomedical algorithms for cardiovascular systems. He is also uh, instrumental in advocating for the low-code, no-code initiative, uh, thus giving clinicians and non-technical personnel the tools to develop sensor-based applications for distributed clinical data collection. Welcome, Shravan. Thank you so much, Tina, and um, thank you for having me back again. This is the third time I'm back here, and the fact that you guys haven't kicked me out is good news. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. Um, I'm really happy that I recognized almost all of you guys, if not uh, most of you out there. So let's get started. Um, I wanna start off by a quick acknowledgement to the team. Um, so two people work really hard on portions of this development. Uh, Yan Jia Hu, he was a student in School of Information. He predominantly researches on AI and ML pipelines. But what this project, he helped a lot with all the AWS backend, as well as adding data to it, which we'll look at as well. And then Gunjil, who uh, just graduated from MIS, he helped a lot with uh, importing, adding all the API calls that did all the importing of data from My Data Helps into Cybers. A big shout out to my collaborators at the Personalized Treatment Lab. I see some of them already on the on the webinar. Uh, without them, wouldn't have been possible. The data I'm showing today, as well as the tools that we build, were built directly um, as a response to some of the issues that they were having. And uh, they were kind enough to let us use some of these data points today for the demo, as well as testing the whole pipeline out. So let's get started by what is high frequency variable data. So um, I define or I believe high frequency variable data is anything that has raw sensor values in it. So your raw acceleration values, gyroscope, things like flux meter coming from a light meter, PPG optical signal, so the actual waveform, uh, the millivolts for that, as well as things like skin temperature. These things are generally sampled. Uh, it's not the norm, but they are sampled between 50 to 100 hertz. So they're extremely high frequency at the sampling rate in which they come true. That generates almost uh, a few million points per metric per day for a participant. So this is widely different than the aggregate level of data that we work with, say with Fitbit or with Garmin, where you look at the steps or you look at the elevation or you look at activity on METs and all of those different things, high frequency data is the actual raw value that goes into calculating that. This lacks any aggregate metrics like I just mentioned and the devices that we have had experience so far, or at least we have started working with most of these is Apple Sensor Kit, uh, Empatica Embrace, which is a new Empatica device, uh, Ultra Human, which is a variable ring form and Aura Ring, which is also a variable ring. So those devices all give us raw um, high frequency data at some level and some scale. So what can we do with it? Because one of the things when people talk about high frequency data is we always ask the question, okay, I have all of this information, can we really do anything with it? And I wanted to show some examples of uh, 
high frequency data that I have been involved with in the past. So on the top left is a, a paper I published when I was a grad student back in 2019. And what we did there was we did gate analysis based on high frequency acceleration data. And this was coming from a combination of IMUs placed on the user's leg, as well as a watch that they were wearing. So we had used, back then we had used the Samsung watch which we had cracked the firmware and we were able to get the raw acceleration data out of that Samsung watch. And that allowed us to know things like whether there's more sway in the person, how are they walking? And where was this used? This was used when we developed a automated six minute walk test. And a six minute walk test is something that physicians give patients before they are discharged from a hospital. And one of the metric is to see how far they can walk in six minutes. It is analogous to a six meter walk test. They both have the same acronym. They have different um, reasons why they're done. So what we did was we tried to measure various uh, walking um, metrics like asymmetry as well as the distance while the person was walking it. And in the end, we were able to do it just based out of the wrist wound watch. And this was back in 2019. Technology as well as devices and algorithms has improved tons after that. Another example that you can see on the bottom left is a recent study we just finished. Um, so we were able to use high frequency raw temperature data from Aura Ring to be able to predict when a mother will go into labor. And we were able to do that with about 70% accuracy seven days before the actual labor onset within a four day window. And um, that was a small sample set and it's only a proof of concept. It's still in preprint right now, but that goes to show that when we start looking at these high frequency data points, it unlocks a whole world of outcomes that we can now start looking at. Finally, on the right-hand side, I'm just showing um, another study we did where we looked at raw PPG values coming in and calculated various heart rate variability metrics to compare whether someone who is walking on a green lush road, whether they have less stress on their autonomic nervous system as compared to someone who is walking in an urban environment. And all of this would not have been possible without the availability of high frequency data and the tools and systems put in place to ingest them quickly and also analyze them. So what are certain challenges to look out for when we talk about high frequency data? So most of the data can be noise. And um, you know, if you just think about it, if you're sampling at such a higher rate, you have noise and variability related to the actual sampling device. You, have, you also have environmental noise. So someone who has worked with accelerometers um, can, can remember that even if accelerometer is placed stationary on a desk, it still has drift in it. And so you have to start removing all of those things, which becomes quite complicated when you have such a lot of high frequency data coming through. Uh, it can be overwhelming to work with because most situations, um, you don't really know where to start with. Traditional plotting tools fail to work. For example, if I put a 20 million point data set inside Plotly, it's just gonna die. Or if I try plotting something in MATLAB over four days, which has around 30, 40 million points, your system is just gonna come to a crawling halt, right? And so moving to systems like Superset, which can have distributed workers that can actually do these processing in a distributed manner and then produce the graphs and stitch everything together. That's something that we can move towards when we have such a large amount of data. CSVs won't load into memory and you can't really open some, any of these big files if luckily if they are in one of those formats, most of the files are in a tightly packed serialized format like Apache Arrow or tightly packed JSON zip. But if they are in an easy to look at tabular format, most of the softwares will come to a grinding halt trying to open them and analyze on it. Sharing data again, giving access becomes really, really difficult. And that's one place where cybers comes in and plays a big role is to be able to share these big files in a very easy manner and give access to cybers users for these files. Otherwise you would you can't send them more email, you'll probably be sending giving each other pen drives to transfer these big files. Um, the breaks and errors in data are hard to detect. And what I mean by that is you might have holes in the data and if without looking and visualizing, humans are very visual. And so without looking at that data, 
it's really hard to know where those breaks are. And when you have such a large amount of data, you don't really know why those missing values or breaks are coming from. And it's really critical to be able to decipher and find those out. Uh, and then monitoring participant compliance becomes basically a guesswork. You don't really know that the users have devices on because you can't ingest the data real time. And traditionally you were not able to raise flags if the user was not wearing them, if the data was not coming in and so on and so forth. So what ends up happening is we usually collect a lot of data and then it just sits there. And I like to say that data does not age like fine wine. Um, it's more like an open bottle of wine. It goes lancet very quickly. And so if you're not able to decipher actionable insights from your sensor data, then it's already starting to get too late. And so there's a need to build a system that does this for high frequency data points. So what is our goal? And when we started working on building not just this system in particular, but sensor fabric as a whole, our goal was to make querying visualization analysis of this high frequency data in an appropriate time. So not one year from today, not three months from today, but maybe a week in appropriate time that allows us to provide actionable insights, accurate and meaningful, uh, so yeah, provide actionable, accurate and meaningful insights into the actual data. Uh, because if you just collect data, but I'm not able to do anything with it, I'm not able to provide tools to be able to analyze it, then it's really not very useful. So for today's webinar, we will specifically be focusing on sensor kit data and a few metrics I wanna highlight that you get from sensor kit. Uh, right now, we have only been able to look at the first three. We haven't really gotten to looking at any of the other ones. It gives you raw acceleration data over X, Y, Z, and it gives you that at 100 hertz frequency. It also gives you ambient light reading in LUX, uh, the placement, so like front and et cetera, as well as the directionality with X and Y. And it gives you rotational weight to the gyroscope using X, Y, Z. The other ones like speech telephony, visits, device usage, we haven't really gotten to it, so I can't speak too much about it right now. So let's take a look at the overall architecture. And if uh, for those who have attended the previous webinars, uh, part one, part two is both, this kind of looks very similar. So what we have, it all starts with our partners at My Data Helps. They do some black magic, get the data from Apple Health Kit. Uh, I should have been sensor kit, sorry, I did not update that. But that comes into My Data Helps. And what we do is we have a cybers app. And there's a lot of stuff going on in the back end, but at the very uh, tip of it, it uses the export APIs that My Data Helps provides, and it downloads uh, zip files every single day into the into Cybers using the Cybers app. And there's a very tiny screenshot, and I'm going to show the app in more detail when we go to a demo portion. But that kind of shows how the app looks like uh, right now. Um, after that, the app does a bunch of processing, which I'll get to in the future slides. It One of it is to flatten the data. So data coming in is not structured. It's uh, in a JSON format. And so we flatten the data out and we write it locally into a .db file. So a big shout out to the Cybers team for making that possible when now we can write SQL and .db files directly to Cybers and so into the data store. So now everything is stored in a single .db file. And also we give an option through the same Cybers tool, if you enter your AWS credentials, it actually pushes it out to our AWS head that goes ahead and ingests everything into S3 uh, and Glue for the schema and then Athena for the serverless querying. So how does the incoming data look like? And this is just a screenshot of how the actual raw data looks like. So it comes in as compressed JSON files. And we are showing an example of a single acceleration file that's coming in, which contains about 10 minutes of data. And it's the, the overall exports are structured by participant and by metric. So when I look at this, when I first looked at this, I had a I was a bit dizzy since it's really difficult to decipher a lot of different things. And that's why this project got kickstarted in the sense that I wanted to create something that's easier to be able to pass this data, that makes it easier to pass this data. So some of the challenges with the raw data we have is, so initially JSON was meant to make life easy for humans, right? It's readable. But in today's world where JSON is packed in such a high degree, it actually makes it really hard. You can Try making it pretty looking and all of those different things, but it still makes it a little hard 
to be able to read those uh, JSON fields, most people who are analytically trained are used to working with tabular and structured data and data dictionaries and all of those different things, which having a serialized high compact format you lose out on. Hard to answer questions about various fields. So if I gave somebody this JSON file and asked them a simple question, hey, what kind of fields are there in it? Um, it wouldn't be as straightforward as just looking at a schema or you know running a quick query uh, to be able to find those. So, so questions like that become difficult to quickly answer and hinder being able to quickly analyze data set, right? Um, I do want to acknowledge that NoSQL databases have gotten a lot, lot better, everything from Mongo to Dynamo, but SQL is still widely used as one of the most popular querying language. And while SQL SQL-like solutions exist for NoSQL engines, they have not quite become popular in academic or research settings. So most people are still used to using SQL-like querying structures, and one of our goals is to try giving them what they're more familiar with. So what was our caveman approach when we started this? Um, to put it simply, we took all of that JSON data and we flattened the heck out of it. And we converted that flattened JSON data into a structured view, and then we figured out how to store that such that we got benefits of shareability, accessibility, scalability, and security associated with that stored data. What we had to do was we had to come up with four things in, in, in the larger picture. We came up with something called what we call a schema. So a schema basically goes and samples random JSON files and random entries within the JSON file to identify the schema. And it does this rambles, random sampling so that if there are different sections of the file which have different schema, then we can find that out. And right now the strategy for the winning strategy is just to do a union of those. And whenever you have a conflict, essentially just shoots it out and says, hey, what do you want to do? Do you want this to be this data type or do you want this to be that data type and so on and so forth. So there's an interactive element involved in that. Uh, Flattener basically goes recursively into the JSON tree. So a JSON file can be represented as a tree and flattens is structured out uh, using some basic rules that we have put, put, place, put in place. A filler goes and fills out all the empty holes left by the flattener. So if you think about taking any uh, tree-like data and trying to flatten it out, the high-level parent elements will be left out as the children are starting to get populated. Uh, the reason this is a separate component is because this can be turned off if you want to save space. So if you don't want to have repeated values, uh, if you don't want to have a more deserialized database, then you can go ahead and turn this feature off as well. And the a final thing is the exporter, which has connections to either export via DuckDB. Uh, it can also export via S3 and Glue. And the reason these, this is separate is because eventually you want to grow the range of exporters we can attach to our pipeline. And so each of these have been built out to be a plug and play solution. So tomorrow if we update our schema, Flatner, Filler, and Exporter wouldn't necessarily break just because we updated one. So I want to give an example of what the Flatner actually does. So on the left-hand side, and I apologize, it's a little difficult to read the letters in it. That's a tree representation of what a JSON might look like, right? And E, which is the, 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 second, the second child on the right, is actually a JSON array. And what we want to do is we want to take all of this data and just flatten it out. And the way we flatten that out is that we just go ahead and put simple underscores. The more deeper or the more nested you go into it. In reality, um, the code is available on GitHub. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated, handling different edge cases as well as uh, adding limits to recursion and the stack and all of those different things go into play when we are doing these things. Um, giving you an example, for example, the top level would be a column called as A. Then after that, there would be a column called A underscore B underscore C, A underscore B underscore D. And the final one would be A underscore E underscore F. And this, because it's a list, E is a list, this would be each element for that particular list would go in that, um, in that data set, right? And uh, what that means is for the parents who are on top of it, like A underscore B underscore D, that might need some filling because now suddenly that has maybe 100 or 200 children and that particular column now starts looking empty. And that's where the filler comes in. It identifies these gaps, it recognizes what, recognizes what needs to be filled out 
and goes ahead and automatically fills it out. What are the trade-offs? So it causes redundancies and increases storage size because we're literally unpacking and decentralizing it. But what do we get in return for that? It becomes much easier to query the data. Uh, we can now go and parallelize this. So we can essentially go and create hashes for different dates of participants, and we can store the data in a parallelized manner then allowing us to query it much faster. And we understand the structure of the data better. And that to me is the most important thing, right? It allows me to make decisions on how to analyze it, looking at what the data is now structured at. So the I want to talk a little bit about the flagner, uh, and I apologize, it's only a single slide, uh, trying to condense everything in it. When we started, that whole recursion operation took about 58.7 seconds for 10 minutes file. So the key amongst you already know this is not going to scale, right? If it takes a one, if it takes one full minute for us to parse the JSON tree for a single file and flatten it and do everything that we're doing recursively, manage stack overflows and all of those things, it takes us a minute for 10 files. When we scale this up to 300 participants across multiple metrics, each of them having hundreds of files, even if we put this in parallel nodes, this is still gonna be a bottleneck. What we are at now after a few weeks is we are about 1.52 seconds per 10 minute file. And the way we actually got to that have been some rather simple, but I would say clever optimizations. So we did away with all the non-primitive data types. So we're using Python to build all of these. And we did away with all the non-primitive types like data, pandas data frames, which were being returned at different levels in the recursion. And we switched to more primitive data types like dictionary that did require us to rethink and rewrite parts of our code. But what we shifted from is we shifted from having a record-based recursion where the, record, the, the children would actually recurse and give you records to a column-based recursion where now the children are returning parts of a column and the vectors of the columns are then starting to get to put together. And what that allows us to do is in the future, we can actually subset the tree and in, in individual nodes can process individual portions of the tree, return columns. You know, if someone's thinking map and reduce, well, I was thinking the same thing. Uh, I don't want to say we are doing exactly map and reduce because that's a lot different, but the idea is the same, right? We take, we're doing computation on smaller nodes and then we're trying to get it up and we're combining all of those things together. That hasn't been done yet. And when we do that, uh, the, the computer scientist in me is itching to do that because it, that will take the time from 1.5 seconds down to a very less than a half a second to do 10 minutes of file data. So looking at the output of a schema, uh, and anybody can access this. So if you have really complicated JSON files, uh, go do a pip install from Sensor Fabric and use the method Sensor Fabric JSON draw dot pretty print schema. It has documentation how you can use that. What that does is it goes and takes a quick sample of the JSON and goes and prints out how the JSON looks like. And for example, this tells me that I have a high level JSON field called as device. Inside that I have system version and system name, model and name. I have another high level field called as samples, which is by the way, an array of length 245. And inside them, I have each of the fields inside samples is a single object called sample, which itself is an array of length 261, right? And even though this is a little difficult to wrap your head, it gives me an idea of how the schema looks like. And uh, we haven't tested it for any JSON that's not from SensorKit, but if you do test it, please add bugs to the Git repository or submit a pull request. And uh, this is something I'm gonna keep asking is for the community to actually contribute and keep sending us pull requests. Some of you guys have already been doing that. It helps us a lot since we are pretty restricted on the team size and the resources we have dedicated for this. Um, the schema also helps us create a global schema for SenseKit. And what you can see here is the column names for the tabular data after they have been flattened out. And it's showing you the different data types that have been associated with it. And if we are not happy with it, we go ahead and manually change those. For now, object is just string. That's how we're interpreting an object data type um, from the schema. So the key features of, I, I don't know if I, I think I missed out on a, I missed out on a slide here. Um, let me just quickly see if I have it. So 
So I don't have the slide. That's okay. I'll just I'll just talk through that particular uh, particular slide. I'll put this on the screen again. And um, what I wanted to talk about is uh, necessarily um, what we are gaining by having a tabular format. And one of the biggest things that we have gained is the ability to just look at snapshots of data. So we can actually export this out of a very simple CSV, uh, a snapshot of the data as a CSV, and then kind of look at it and see that, okay, this is what we are getting. We can sit with the analytical team and figure out, okay, this is what, and, and the domain experts and figure out this is the outcome. This is how we want to approach this problem and then go ahead and tackle that. So that's given us a, a really good way of um, looking at these different things. All right, I'm going to pause for a minute here as I actually go and open up um, Cyrus and I can show uh, the show the, how the app looks like, but I'm open to questions as we are going ahead and doing this. Now, right, can everybody see my cyber screen? If some, if Tina, if you can give me a thumbs up. Yep, looks good. Awesome. Um, so the app that we are talking about, uh, let me go into apps and development, is called a Sensor Kit. And the app has a lot of customizations. And I just want to walk everyone over what those customizations are. And so at the top portion is all of your information about My Data Helps. Uh, and if you're not familiar with these fields, please go look at the webinar before this, which I gave where I talk about how to get these values. There has been an important change though. We no longer pass account secrets as just uh, strings. We pass them as base64 encoded. And if you're on Mac, you can just use the base64 command on your terminal. But if you're on Linux, you have to use base64 minus W0. So that it basically combines everything into a single uh, line. And the reason is because uh, Docker in general are, um, yeah, so Docker in general does not like being passed multi-line uh, environment variables. And so when you get your secret key from my data hubs, please convert that into a base64 format before you add to it. Your account ID is the same account ID that I talked about last time that you get from My Data Helps for your service account, project ID for the project in there that you want to the exports. And here's where the fun part starts. So if you don't, ideally, if you look at the raw source code that's actually powering this tool or the app as well, it doesn't require to have start and end date. And if you don't put that in, it automatically downloads the latest uh, export. However, when you're designing this app, we made that as a, a, a required field because we don't accidentally want someone to leave them blank and then try it and get confused about why their previous data is not being downloaded. So you can add the start date uh, as year, month, and day, as well as the end date. It is not inclusive of the end date and was made that way by design. And the reason for that is if you just want to download a single day of data, you enter the start date as a day that you want to download the data. And then the end date will be a day after that. So you only download a single day of data. The next configuration is local DB. And so this is a path relative to your home directory for your data store. And so right now I've just set that to my db.db and that's where your duck db is going to get stored. And that's when you're doing local. So if you remember the, uh, the PowerPoint slide, you had two options, you could store it locally or you could store it on AWS. And if you, the local is not a uh, option, you have to have a local storage option here. So you have to put that. AWS is optional. So you can see none of these fields are required. If you do have your, AWS credentials, like the S3 path where you want data to be uploaded. Uh, there is AWS data name, database name, um, your, from GLU where you want this schema to be stored, you can add those in along with the IAM keys as well as secrets, um, which have the appropriate permission to access those resources. Uh, right now the region is just default to East one. It can be changed to whichever you want. Be mindful though, that the moment you fill all of this in, the, the, the tool will automatically pick this up and start uploading to your AWS. So if you don't want it to upload to AWS and incur charges, I would suggest leaving this blank. And 
this is really good if you want to be able to test things out. So if, let's say you want to look at a week of data, right? Uh, right now we just experimented with almost a month of data in DuckDB and it's fine. And uh, granted it's only been a few participants, but if you want, let's say a week of big data snapshot, you could just do it all on DuckDB. I am going to stop screen sharing because I need to show a app running and I'm gonna actually put the secret key and I don't want that to be shown on screen when I do that. Oh, Shravan, you're no fun. I know. I mean, <laughs> our, our friends at, from Cat Evolution here would crucify me for accidentally getting up those yeah. things. So I'm I'm being as careful as I can. Yes, I can. All right. Um, I am the the part I'm actually going to show is how the start and end dates actually work as a quick screen that because I don't have the keys. So the start and end dates right now I've given are uh, just one day. So eight twenty one, eight twenty two. And it, so that would only download data from 821 because like I said, 822, it's non-inclusive. We also mentioned it right there. All right, let's 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 go back. I'm gonna hit next on this. I'm gonna hit start. Um, for larger data sets, and I would, as this is launching, I'll kind of talk over it. Um, for, let's see, go to analysis. So you don't see the keys. So for larger data sets, I would recommend exporting maybe once every few days, because if you wait for a month to export everything, you're gonna have a massive amount of data and you're probably gonna hear back from somebody at cyber saying, hey, why are you using that much amount of storage? Or, and this it does take a lot of processing as well to recursively go and flatten all of these things out. So once we started this, it, it actually just drops you into a very familiar looking Jupyter notebook. So that um, app is attached to this particular True, uh, right now the automated setup is not working and I apologize, that should have been working. So I'm gonna run you guys to a manual way of doing this um, and hopefully it works. Um, so that I'll, walk, I'll kind of talk over as we are going to it. So if you go and look at our repository, which you see here, uh, there is a mail repository called uh, Cyber Sensor Kit Help. This is basically the same code that the Docker container is using in the tool uh, and we had some issues, sadly, with it. My apologies, wrong screen, too many screens. Uh, let's go ahead and get that repository. Oops, it does this sometimes. Let's give it a try again. I will open it up to questions as I'm trying to get the Git um, to be downloaded correctly. If anyone who has more experience of cybers knows if I'm doing anything wrong and why Good this is clone. not being stored. Oh, thank you, Nirav. This is what happens when I don't have my notes in front of me and I'm just like winging it. Thank you. All right, so once we have that, uh, hopefully no more embarrassing mistakes. Uh, we start off with running the setup.bash and the setup script essentially goes ahead and sets all the um, sensor fabric or sensor kit MDH portion of it. And that can be found in our GitHub repository as well. Uh, that is this piece of code. Um, that essentially it has the schema, has the flattener and everything that I talked about is in there. Once this has been set up, um, there's, a, there's a small thing right now, the, the sensor fabric library that we are using is slightly ahead of the library in the pip. And I, we can't really update the library in pip since it has a few dependencies we haven't tested. And surprising to me, quite a few people are actually using the sensor fabric library across campus. So right now uh, you have to also go ahead and source the environment file, which we provide in the repository that actually sets the paths to the sensor fabric Git library, Git code that we have downloaded. And once that's done, you can go ahead and you can run. Um, I'm going to go and see. I already have, sorry. So I already have a database here. I'm going to go ahead and just rename this and just call it one. Uh, this was something I was testing last night to make sure things are working fine. And, and oops, did that work? Yep, it did work. And once that's done, I'm gonna now go ahead and call a method um, 
sorry, they call a bash script called start dot sh. Oh, let me see if I can show you this as well. And so what I'm showing you here is uh, the met the the scripts automatically create a file called a storage.json. You're free to change this. But what this has is it automatically generates the path where your local DB will be stored based on the environment variables you gave it. And if you had given it the S3 path in the database, it would also populate that. And when the exporter runs, which is the final step of the code, it actually pulls from this to see what it needs to export to. So whether it needs to export to a local database or whether you have the information to actually export to a AWS um, end as well. And so let's go ahead and run bash on this one. And it's gonna take a little bit of time. I'm just gonna let it run and most likely may not finish. Um, for some reason, it thinks it needs to export to AWS as well, and it's not able to read from that file. So I don't know what's going on wrong, but I don't wanna be spending too much time here. Um, I did go ahead and create out, um, let's see. I do have a, um, database file ready or a, a quick notebook ready that actually shows you. So when we did this uh, earlier, when we did this yesterday, last night essentially, so this was the database that everything got exported into. And it, we just trying to show how we have structured the table. So now you have all of your different um, sensor, sensor kit metrics structured as a single table. And then within that, you can actually go and see all the independent uh, fields have been stored as columns and their respective data types. One thing which I do want to point out, and I do write it here as well, is we are storing timestamps, uh, date timestamps as strings right now. And the only reason we're doing that is so we can actually retain the uh, time zone offset here as well. But you can easily go and convert them into timestamps um, using any SQL engine. And so that hopefully shouldn't be too much of a um, constraint when we are using these different solutions. Uh, this is essentially just going ahead and uh, showing uh, what we see uh, inside the acceleration tape. And so this is a single day of acceleration values for just one person. This is all just test data right now. And we're going ahead and calculating the magnitude of acceleration. So doing things like this becomes extremely simple for us once we have all of that data stored in a structured uh, manner inside it. Um, I think that is all. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time and I'm itching to try to figure out what was going wrong with it right now and why it's not able to create the file, uh, but I'm not I'm gonna, let it, I'm gonna let it be the way it is. I'm gonna quickly shoot over to AWS and show if you had put the AWS, uh, if you had put all the AWS fields, what would that look like as well? So I think it should be in this one. Okay, and so if you didn't do all of that, it AW, you would get tables created inside Glue, which you can access to Athena, and the tables will be the exact same like I showed you on cybers.db. And the way uh, right now, this is a different data source. So this is, I think, I believe it's a whole week and a half of data from two individuals across all three of them. I'm not really sure what the units are, definitely more than a few million here, but around um, 17 million or something, around 1.7. Trillion, I don't know. Anyways, um, but that's the amount of information that's come in. Um, and it took about 1.9 seconds to do just a quick count on it, right? And the way we are achieving these things is we have partitioned the data very heavily. So let me go and show you guys that. And if you look at data sets, we are going and partitioning the data set based on the participants. And all of this is taken care of by the exporter, which is running inside the tool to go ahead and export all of these and create these different partition, part, partitions for the participant. And then each partition has all of these tiny little parquet files, which then Athena just groups up and does a really job, good job of aggregating all of these things together. All right, I'm gonna conclude the presentation. Um, I promised 
40 minutes and very over that I feel like. So in conclusion, the key features that are of using Cyrus for us is that the app allows us to automatically ingest from my data house. We don't really need to have our uh, researchers or our uh, coordinators go ahead and download our data files or uh, go and use APIs. One thing I would note is that this not only exports the sensor kit data, but if you have survey data, it also exports all of that right now. So please be mindful of what you're exporting and where you're exporting and how you're using this. Our projects right now only have sensor kit data for the test one. Uh, it does schema discovery and breaks it down into tables like we saw, uh, by flattens it as well as does data type validation. It stores the data locally into DuckDB. Um, and while I was not able to show that ingestion, we looked at a DuckDB file that I created last night and being able to read all of that using the standard uh, Python and Jupyter to be able to access that. You can also share your DuckDB file through data store with anybody, right? So let's say you created a week long of import data. All you have to now do is share that file with another user in that within Cyrus, and they can also start analyzing and helping you with it. We haven't done this portion, but on the roadmap, we would like to partition the DuckDB files in, in, individually by dates and participants and study periods. And that way we're using the classic divide and conquer computer science rule, where we're trying to minimize it and then have a hash that can allow us to look up and watch a picture of the DuckDB file. So far, DuckDB has been able to handle trillions of data points and haven't had an issue, so we never actually even thought about doing it. You don't have any hefty cloud costs. So if you're exporting to AWS, like I just showed you, and using all the S3 and Athena, while you're still exporting it from the tool, if you if you, if you, do, if you don't do it, you don't really have to pay any of those cloud costs. You pay the fees that Cyrus has, but you don't have to pay any of the AWS charges associated with it. And this approach is suitable for most small to medium studies. You know, So if you're, unless you're going and enrolling thousands of participants, most 10, 20 people studies will most likely work very well with this structure. As usual, I highly request bug reports as well as literal pull requests. Um, so the helper code can be found on Git, which is what I just ran on Cyrus to set things up. Um, the actual sensor fabric Python library, which now has the, uh, just key, the part of the schema as well as going and parsing raw JSON to come up with a structure is also on GitHub. And the final one, which is a sensor kit MDH, that's the one that controls all of this, where it does all the importing, it does the flattening and all of that part. Sorry, the flattening is actually part of the sensor fabric library. Uh, this one only has the controller and importing and the exporter is part of this particular code base. With that, thank you so much. A big shout out to Tina, Nirav, and Basil. I've, I've been keeping on bugging you guys with questions about this. And um, obviously a big shout out to Zach's team at um, Psychology for helping me use all of this data set. And a big shout out to Cyber's team for adding the DuckDB and SQLite drivers uh, into data store. And with that, I'm gonna conclude and open it up for questions if we have any. Thank you. Thank you, Shravan. Are there any questions for Shravan? Um, feel free to either type them in or you're welcome to unmute yourself and just ask away. Okay. Wow, Shravan, that's a lot of work. And thank you very much for um, Absolutely. putting it all together. So we will, uh, like I said, this is being recorded and we'll post this on our YouTube channel and on our website. Um, if there are no questions, I think you were so thorough and showed people exactly all the different steps you they needed to take. Yeah. Um, and just so, a quick thing, we haven't fully reached at analyzing. I had to build the, the structure before we got there. Um, and I know that a few folks here were interested in that. So if you guys want a part two, please hit up Tina and let her know in a month or so if you want to see the analysis portion of uh, the same thing. We can. There is a question for you. <clears throat> How can we have more high frequency sensors integrated with sensor fabric? Absolutely, uh, Gustavo. So right now the way sensor fabric is created is created in chunks. So we have an ingester. And so if we have a high frequency sensor, like for example, Movi Sense, that doesn't really have APIs or something like that, we would have to create an ingester that talks to it. 
But once that's done, everything else below that pipeline falls in place. So the ingester exports data in a particular format, and then we are able to take that data and then ingest it either to the Cybers route or the AWS route in the exact same manner that I showed right now. And so if, if, if you have any more high fidelity sensors, I'm um, very happy to start building out the ingestion heads for those. So that's literally all we need right now. Thank, Thank you, Basil. You. All right, if there are no further questions, then please mark your calendars for our next webinar on April 19th, when Mariah Wall, Cybers' user interface and application developer, presents on what, what research software engineers need to know about user experience when building data science software. It should be really helpful to have that perspective uh, for those of you who write code and uh, want your applications to be as useful and as uh, <laughs> effective as possible. Thank you all for attending and we will see you online next month. Thank you, Shravan. Thank you guys.